Uh, I would point out that the uh, Quality of Care Committee included uh, Mr. Arthur Levin, uh, who is in fact a consumer and uh, a patient representative on that committee. Unfortunately, Art had a serious illness uh, several months ago. Otherwise, he would have been here and would have been part of the discussion uh, since patients were really a very crucial consideration. I would also point out that in the aftermath of the report, patient behavior changed significantly. There were a significant number of families who wanted to be in the room with the patient when they were hospitalized, who wanted to know what the medication was that the patient was receiving. Patients in many communities were empowered with their families to do that. So we have a great deal to, more to do with families, but I believe that the patient role was, in fact, from the very beginning, seen as very important. Um, the, 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 this report, the, for, I should also point out, CHASM came out in 2001. Uh, we view these two reports as being the seminal reports. Uh, CHASM was 14 years ago. Uh, ERA was 1999. We compromised at 15 years for both of them. In, in, in any case, um, one of the re remarkable things about the report was, in fact, uh, the fact that it was released in the Rose Garden, that the President of the United States at that time, having been briefed by a number of key people, thought this was very important. One of the key people behind the scenes was the late John Eisenberg. John was profoundly committed to improving quality of care, and in the aftermath of the report, worked with the legislature to get the, some of the legislation which was referred to, including getting the appropriation for uh, ARC uh, to finance research in this area for the first time. We thought that the uh, occasion of this remembrance this celebration should not uh, ignore the enormous contribution which John Eisenberg made to many things, but particularly this report. And we're very grateful to Carolyn Clancy, who was a close colleague of John, uh, for uh, making a presentation uh, on John's career and his contributions. Carolyn? So thanks very much, Ken. This is uh, an incredible honor. But before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, John's wife, who's here with us today, uh, Didi, and also his son, who is Mike, who's right behind the uh, video camera there. So I'm going to start off. Um, thank you. Uh, with John in his own words, testifying at a hearing uh, shortly after uh, To Air as Human was published, and he's testifying before uh, Senator Arlen Specter, who is uh, shown here. This is just a short clip, and I think if I click it, it'll go, yeah? Thank you. Whoops. This went the wrong way. Do I click on the Thank video? you, Senator Specter. Um, Mr. Chairman, when I read the Institute of Medicine report, uh, on patient safety and errors in the healthcare system, I, like every physician, had some reminiscences. I brought back some memories. I recalled a woman whom I took care of. We had had a pap test done to screen her for cervical cancer. The result was suspicious, but I never knew that because I never got the report back. And I didn't realize that I hadn't gotten the report back until she called me and asked about the report. I tracked it down. I found out it was suspicious. We followed it up, and fortunately, it turned out not to be anything serious. But that was a near miss. It was a near miss that could have been a tragedy had she not called me, had she not taken part in detecting and preventing errors. Now, that happened at the University of Pennsylvania when I headed the General Internal Medicine Division there. It's a great hospital, as you know, but even at the best institutions, errors happen. Senator. So John Eisenberg, I had the amazing good fortune to train with very early in my career as a fellow, and I was almost afraid of him then. I mean, at a very, very early stage in his career, he was already making phenomenal contributions to literally creating the field of general internal medicine. Um, 
I could see then, sometimes I thought more clearly than he could, that he was headed for a world of health policy. Um, but one of the reasons he was so effective at it wasn't because he communicated at a hearing in very erudite terms, although he was more than capable of that, and I do believe his family would attest to that, um, but because he told a story that was accessible and understandable. And if you were to watch the full uh, video of this hearing, you would see Senator Specter actually grasping it and getting into it and asking good questions and actually doing a little storytelling of his own in return with John in terms of what it would take to engage the Congress in this. But uh, after training with John as a fellow I then, and watching his career soar, he. Uh, created divisions of general internal medicine. He trained a phenomenal number of people. In fact, when he died uh, way too early in 2002, about a year after this uh, video, um, I was astonished by how many people emailed me because they just had to tell someone what an impact John had had on them. Um, literally thousands and thousands of people considered John to have been an important mentor in their life. Oftentimes that meant meeting him at a meeting and having a relatively short conversation, but encouragement or some good ideas, questions, and so forth to some that he had a longer term engagement with. If you were to look across uh, the federal government now, you would see many leaders who uh, were trained by John, from Nikki Laurie at HHS, uh, to Dr. David Shulkin at uh, VA, who's now the Under Secretary for Health. And the list just goes on and on, and I expect that list uh, will go on and on uh, for many years. But telling the story was something that John talked about all the time. I suspect, Dee, Dee that this was uh, related to his having been married to a journalist and uh, having had that good fortune. Uh, but one of the ways he tried to tell the story about ARC, which wasn't exactly a household world, word at that time, uh, was through bumper stickers. So here is one bumper sticker for ARC. We were trying to think about how do you keep this uh, top of mind. Um, another one was information for better decisions in healthcare. Um, User-driven research, talk to the people who are actually doing the work, as Brent said, at the sharp end. Um, ask them what they need. Where is it that better information and better science could help them do a better job? And uh, put practice into research is the same kind of idea. And my personal favorite, because during John's tenure as administrator and then director, literally the name of the job changed. Um, but the agency changed its name as well from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Policy, no policy and research, to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, or ARC. He took great pride in the name ARC, was often thought, referred to as John of ARC. So he, <laughs> he had this bumper sticker made, uh, saving lives uh, two by two. Um, but what's very, very interesting, I had the good fortune to be interviewed by uh, Mike, his son, a few months ago, um, who has actually taken that whole idea of telling the story uh, much further, and I was thrilled that you could be here to get some video today, and has been talking to people on the street about what information do you need in healthcare, what does research mean to you, um, what are you worried about in healthcare, and so on and so forth, and really doing just a phenomenal uh, job. Something about the apple not falling far from the tree comes to uh, mind here. But he constantly talked to us about this, constantly uh, talked about, uh, would ask people, you know, can you tell your mother what it is that you do? Does that make sense? Because if we can't explain why this work is important, then why should it be supported, uh, and so forth. Now, when he died in 2002, um, Senator Frist, former Senator Frist, actually uh, sent us a phenomenal tribute, which said, as a physician, Dr. Eisenberg saved the lives of many. Um, as a leader, he enhanced the lives of millions, and as a friend, he touched the lives of us all. So this slide is a photo of a plaque that hangs in the ARC building and also hangs outside a, probably the most prominent conference room at uh, the Humphrey Building, which is, you know, headquarters for the Department of Health and Human Services. 
um, a really remarkable tribute for a remarkable man. Um, and to this day, I think his most compelling quality was his ability to understand and to be able to translate from extremely technical, complicated, sophisticated terms, and believe me when I tell you John could get into it, um, to uh, language that people could understand. Because in the end, that communication is so vital to making sure that we get to a place where care is reliably safe and the highest possible quality every time. Now, I'm making this all sound very happy and rosy. Of course there were problems. There were budget problems. Uh, a former member of Congress said to me once, the good news and bad news for your agency is um, everything you do is about where the rubber meets the road. That means everyone can understand it, that's a good thing, and that means everyone can understand it and has a strong opinion, and that is not such a good thing. So uh, there were lots and lots of uh, challenges. But uh, this old cover from a New Yorker magazine, and it was uh, quite remarkable to hear the glass half full or half empty or, re or engineered incorrectly earlier this morning. Um, John had this hanging in his office and was constitutionally incapable of seeing it as anything but half full. And I know that Donna Shalala, for whom he worked directly, and so many other people would have appreciated that. He was so excited about the possibilities for making care safer, and while he could have easily made the case that we needed a billion dollars to do that, he made damn sure that we did the very best and returned the best possible value to Americans and the taxpayers for the resources that were given to ARC. So thank you for the opportunity to make this tribute. I think he made our lives richer, and he made a huge, huge dent on health care here in the U.S. and around the world. Thank you. Carolyn, th thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I worked with John for many years. I uh, was on his faculty when he was chair of medicine at Georgetown, and I would just add to your eloquent comments, he was a terrific bedside physician. He was an outstanding teacher, uh, and he manifested that. And a lot of the reasons that he was so effective from a public policy point of view was he really had the r real life experiences that made it really believable, but so thank you very, very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the, this program has included, or will include some 22 different speakers, uh, five panels. It's a very complicated program. We were enormously fortunate uh, that uh, out of the terrific IOM staff, uh, Lauren Schoen and Amy Geller, as well as Clyde Bainey, uh, staffed this activity, uh, worked with many of you to have, have it happen, and I want to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts that they've made in order to make this a very good meeting. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. I see Amy sitting here. Please uh, con communicate our appreciation to your colleagues from this point of view. I'll remind you again that we will have a session at the end of the day in which we want suggestions and uh, comments made with regard to uh, how we ought to proceed in the future. There were our box lunches in the Great Hall. You could sit in the Great Hall, the East Court, or the lecture room. But please be back promptly at 1.30 because, again, we have two very good panels and we want to start on time. Thank you. <laughs>